Hey farmers and landowners, this is Damian Mason coming at you with a question. Have you ever had disease or pest problems cost you money by reducing your yield? Well, of course you have. We fight this, right? That's what production agriculture is all about, is working as best we can to put out a great yield, and to do so, oftentimes, you've got to overcome disease and pests. The problem is we usually treat those diseases and pests after the problem, right? So what if you could do it proactively? What if you had a tool that gave you predictive analytics? so that you would know if you have things like corn rootworm, uh, soybean cyst nematode, sudden death syndrome. Well, you have that tool now. It's from Pattern Ag. Pattern Ag doing predictive soil analytics way beyond just the old days of sticking a probe in the ground every few acres and saying, hey, wow, we got some nitrogen deficiency here. They'll let you know if you have pests and disease. Go to pattern.ag. That's www.pattern.ag to learn more about this awesome technology and how it can help you increase your yields by taking care of diseases and pests before they cause you harm. Well, greetings and thanks for being here for another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture with Damian Mason. That's me, of course. But you know what? You didn't tune in for me. You tuned in for my guest in this episode because he's a good one. His name is Ken Wall. He is an asparagus entrepreneur. I don't know what you're thinking. Like you're going, wait a minute, asparagus entrepreneur. I've just been talking to this guy for 45 minutes before I even hit record, just kind of catching up and run through some stuff. There's a big industry out there, right? It's called agriculture. And then within this industry, there's a whole bunch of little teeny pockets that you don't even think about, right? My uh, episode there a couple of weeks ago about fats and oils. You're like, what? So anyway, think about this. There's this asparagus business. And there's a guy in Ontario. That's the province in Canada that is home to the biggest city, Toronto. And there is an asparagus association up there. That's how I came across Ken because there's a guy named Brandon Yacht uh, hired me years ago when he worked for an ag retailer chain up there in Canada. And um, I keep up with him on LinkedIn and he's been in my audience a couple of different times. I said, Hey, I want to talk to you about asparagus. So he lines me up with this Ken wall guy, Sandy shore farms, North shore of Lake Erie, Lake Ontario. I'm sorry. Lake Ontario, oh, Lake Erie, Lake Erie, like yeah. Lake Erie. And they produce, asparagus. He also has a seed business. He also does some niche manufacturing of equipment for this business. So I said, you got to come on, tell us all about this. So it's a conversation with an asparagus entrepreneur. By the way, this guy started out as a farm kid and then was an attorney. Give us some background, Ken, then take us to where we are now. Absolutely. Good to be on the show, Damien. Um, yeah, I grew up on a, on a small family farm here in the North shore of Lake Erie. Um, growing uh, fruits and vegetables, and, and asparagus was one of the key pieces. Um, in my early 20s, headed off, go west, young man, went to Vancouver, uh, completed some um, education out there, and eventually uh, started practice law uh, in Vancouver. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Fascinating field. Love the, uh, the intellectual stimulation and the opportunity to interact with some key issues in the community. Uh, but I found myself sitting in my office, staring out over the uh, the ocean and saying, I wonder what uh, what's happening back to the family business. I wonder if, you know, what the markets are in this commodity or that crop. Uh, I wonder what the uh, the uh, chances are. Yeah, you know, it's just my head was going there. And I uh, and then a number of other personal issues came up. And so I said, OK, it's time to go back. So the family was gracious enough to allow me to return to uh, to the operation. And so I moved back uh, with a couple little boys in 1994. And um, and we uh, started growing the business from a small family farm uh, into a little more, probably a, a mid-scale operation. So uh, Sandy Shore uh, grows um, uh, vegetables and on a, approximately 1,500 acres here in the North Shore of Lake Erie. We're almost directly across the lake from Cleveland. We can see the lights of Cleveland from, uh, actually from my uh, windows on my house at night. Um, and uh, we're also, 15, 20 years ago, we, we looked at um, a lot of the, the crops that we were growing and realized uh, that the real opportunity for us was actually in adding some value to the crops that we produce. And so our focus is we don't allow anything to leave our farm gate without adding some value to it. So whether that's cooling or grading or packaging or um, processing in some fashion. And so we have a, a large uh, pack facility for our asparagus as well as 
the asparagus that we grow as well as the asparagus for about 12 other growers within the community. And so we're package cooling, grading, packaging, asparagus, shipping it throughout uh, North America. We were as far west as California this year, as far south as uh, I think we were in uh, Georgia. Um, All right, you're, you're going you're going on a lot, and yeah. uh, I, I like it because there's a lot to be said here. So let's go back here a couple of uh, sure. Um, you came back with your two kids. Yeah, at least one of them still involved in the business. Yes, he is. And then uh, they were little then, and that was in the '90s. The family farm was not what it currently is. Did you inherit by, uh, how did, how did it start there? And then take us th through that little thing. Cause obviously 1500 acres of specialty crop is fairly significant. 1500 acres of soybeans isn't a big deal. 500 acres of stuff that you're touching every, with the degree that you are at specialty crop, that's a lot. So what were you back then in 1994 when you moved back? I moved back and my dad and my uh, sister and brother-in-law who had joined the business when I left originally in the eighties, um, uh, had approximately 200 acres of, of ground. And, uh, and then we bought out, uh, my, uh, sister and brother-in-law and I bought out my father, um, several years later and started to grow the business. And, uh, the reality is, um, like so many other areas of business scale is important and significant and certainly in production agriculture and in uh, the vegetable deal as well. So it's extremely difficult. And I think, um, uh, we're seeing this more and more and more, you know, Damon, you and I chatted a few minutes ago about family farm and the future of the family farm. The, the problem is that there's so much pressure on small family farming businesses from a capital perspective, um, from a regulatory perspective. Um, I think rationalization within the, uh, the food industry, retail industry, it's very, very difficult. My dad used to sell, you know, a pallet or two of asparagus or some other vegetable fruit to um, small retailers. And there were 40 or 50 of them in, yeah. in Ontario. And now uh, the Canadian market is dominated by basically four major retailers. I mean, they control 70, 80 percent. So, you know, you call up a retailer and say, hey, I want to sell. Uh, I've got three pallets of, of asparagus for you. And he says, uh, no, I'm looking for three trailer loads. Yeah. Of asparagus. So yeah, I mean, that's the one thing that a lot of people to. don't uh, get our, our town friends um, that talk about agriculture, you know, and I live half the year in, in the suburbs of Phoenix and they'll say things like, well, I just wish there was more small family farms, right? I don't, I don't like industrial agriculture. I'm like, you realize there's an entire complex here. Um, if Damien Mason grows something just because I can grow and produce something here in Huntington, Indiana, I need a place to go with that. No. And so, um, I might grow really good, uh, whatever, you know, uh, kumquats, hell, I don't know, uh, you know, name the thing, cabbage. I got to either process it myself like you do. I got to have a contract with Walmart, Kroger, you know, Publix. I mean, like you said, once you get past the four or five big grocery chains, in the United States of America, you've taken care of 80% of the calories that are sold in the United States of America or more so. So there is the issue of oligopolistic economies. And then how do you have market access for that infrastructure? So scale has always been an issue. But you said something interesting before we hit record. First off, I want you to tell us about asparagus, but maybe secondly, there's 3,800 acres of asparagus in the province of Ontario. Correct. Ontario, I think, is the biggest or second biggest province. And they make the provinces big up there in Canada. Uh, I know it's the most populous. Yes. 3,800 3, acres, you know, I can go down a road here. 3,800 acres is not. 3,800 acres, that ain't a whole hell of a lot of acres. No, you get a bunch of asparagus off of those acres, right? Um, yeah, it's we're talking intense management. Intense. Uh, I mean, we have 450 employees working for us during our asparagus season. And so this is... Um, and by the way, those 3,800 are not all yours. There's 70, no, no. 72 different producers Correct. of asparagus in the province of Ontario. You're one of them. You have 1,500 acres of produce. How many of those 1,500 acres are devoted to asparagus at any given time? We, we grow about 300 acres ourselves, and then we pack for another pack and sell for other growers, probably another five or 600 acres. Yeah. So... That's the other one. You talk about value added. Um, well, you use the word process because 
Canadians are funny. They like to say host instead of house, and they say process instead of process. <laughs> we would call it processing here. Right. Process for these other folks. So it adds value, and you're not taking advantage of those people. They don't have as many acres, and so they want to get their stuff processed so that it can go downstream in, in the marketplace. So do they pay you, or do you just buy it from them? How does that work on the acres that you process that is other producers? We take on product, comes into our uh, facility, we cool it, we grade it, we determine how many pounds come off a particular lot on any particular day, and, the, and then we sell it in the marketplace. And the growers get paid on the basis of how many pounds we actually recovered from the raw product that they delivered us, and then we pull our pricing on a weekly basis. So what I get paid, the growers get paid. That's the sort of thing that we Yeah. So, but yeah, you're making a little margin on the Yes. on the processing that's correct and handling and you're obviously making much more margin on your own because sure. you're 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 from start to finish yep. where does your asparagus go um probably you mentioned sure. everything from georgia to california and i thought my god california brings in produce from canada that seems strange to me but go ahead so yeah it's a strange world produce world is uh we ship as far west as vancouver island and we've been on uh, newfoundland um, on Canada's East Coast. So we ship all across the country. We deal with the major retailers here in Canada. Uh, we also ship, we're very, very close. We're proximate. We're local from uh, the perspective of, let's say, the East Coast, Boston, New York. There's not a lot of asparagus production on the East Coast. So where does it come from? It's going to be Peru, Mexico, Michigan, or Washington State. There is a small industry in New Jersey as well, very aggressive, and they do a good job down there as well, but they certainly don't supply enough to feed the entire East Coast. So we ship, we're, you know, 10 hours away from Philly, New York, we're 12 hours out of Boston, and so we can easily ship loads into uh, those marketplaces. Well, not to mention there's 7 million people in the big city just to your east by an hour or two, right? Yeah. The, the GTA, Toronto area, Montreal, uh, large urban centers. And so we're shipping into those. Uh, those so markets. here's the thing. I've got an asparagus patch out here that uh, my neighbor got crowns, as they're called. And you can tell us a bit more about that. And he came over and he's one of those guys that always has a garden. All he says, hey, I got a bunch of asparagus crowns over then. I, I already put my patch in. I don't need these. And I said, OK, uh, explain, explain that to me. So we went out to an area. We tilled it up. And I think we put down some mulch and we stuck these things in the ground. It's the greatest thing in the world. Once you stick asparagus in the ground, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, it, it's there, and um, it's going to be there again next year. Tell us about this thing. What's a crown, and why does it, once it's in the ground, is it there forever? Uh, we've got asparagus fields. When I was growing up, my dad had a field that lasted 30 years. Now, the productivity and the spear diameter starts to tail off after 10 or 15 years. Um, but, yeah, those it's a, it, it's a perennial, lasts a long, long time. Um, typically, we start from seed, we grow the crown, create a crown in a nursery type setting, and then we transplant that crown into the ground. That's Why is it called a want. crown? Because it's like a bulb. I mean, it's a, it's a small plant, right? Yeah, I don't know. Ancient terminology. Who knows where that came from? But it's a it's typically we refer to it as an asparagus crown. So now that's a, a nice segue. I want to talk about the uh, the seed business. So one of the problems that we always had within our industry is we had uh, varieties that were developed. They were either open pollinated varieties, which means that they were half male, half female. And in the produce business, the female plant, because it's spending so much energy growing, producing seed for next year, it doesn't put as much energy into actually producing the, the spears that we're looking for. Um, and so either we were growing those open pollinated varieties back in the 50s, 60s and 70s, or uh, we were growing varieties that were produced and developed in regions that just were not suitable for a colder growing climate. So back in the 70s, early 80s, the Ontario industry started funding a breeding program at the University of Guelph. Uh, we had some brilliant researchers and breeders, and they did an amazing job putting together a, a, a program. And we've developed a series of varieties um, out of the University of Guelph. Uh, Millennium, Eclipse, Equinox, these are rock star varieties and they completely taken the North American industry by storm. Um, the industry, because we funded it, um, we had the rights to commercialize. And so we set up a company called Fox Seeds. I'm involved in that one. And, and we distribute that seed globally 
Uh, we probably have about 90 or 95 percent of the North American market right now. Um, these are amazing varieties and the complete. What did you, call, what did you say? You said we're involved. Is it the growers of Ontario that are part yes. owners? Yeah. Okay. So the Grow Association in Ontario was the one that was funding this breeding program to the tune of millions of dollars over the last 40 years, 45 years. And now in the last 10 or 15 years, that commercialization opportunity existed. And so we set up a for-profit company owned in a roundabout way by the Growers Association. And I, uh, I'm one of the board directors. There are three of us that, that run the organization and Brandon, who you mentioned a little while ago, uh, we just hired him on as our CEO to handle day-to-day -day operations. Talk so, about you, you had the university did some research and then obviously the non-ag people, uh, what uh, I'd say the GMO opposition thing was about 12 to or 10 years ago, eight years ago, yeah. uh, the world was bananas. It seems like the, between COVID and climate change, they've moved on to some new uh, crises and uh, some new religion. Are there any genetically engineered produce crops? Um, I mean, potatoes kind of got there, didn't they? There are some, and there are some approvals. By the way, asparagus is not what we have is a hybrid seed uh, developed through traditional breeding uh, programs. This is not a genetically modified crop whatsoever. Yeah, it's just a um, you just hybridized asparagus and the stuff correct. that you get now. You mentioned it, it, through hybridization and technological advancements, your yields are better than what your dad got, and also you turn that ten years is probably twelve to fifteen is the most you'll ever keep in a field in asparagus. Uh, we've got some uh, fifteen to twenty year old fields, but typically the decline starts to happen after about fifteen years. But these varieties that we were utilizing and, and growers here in North America are utilizing, they, um, they've really revolutionized the industry. My dad used to pull off two and two and a half thousand pounds to the acre. Um, and our industry average here in Ontario was probably in the seven to eight thousand pounds. I was going to ask you, so seven to eight thousand pounds per acre. That's correct. Is a, an average yield right now among the Ontario is that among you or among all Ontario? Um, I'm going to suggest that there is a, um, a group of commercial growers. We have 72 growers in the province, and probably about 30 or 35 of those are what I would refer to as commercial growers who are strongly focused on the production of asparagus. And those growers typically will get in that seven to 8,000 pound range. I know of growers consistently finding nine and 10, and I'm aware of a field that went 13. Um, here in Ontario. So uh, those are very, very good growers using, uh, you know, exceptional uh, cultural practices and, and having great success. Yeah. You don't concentrate just on asparagus. You've got your other acres. Um, you've got a rotation, but you don't really wor worry about a rotation until after 10 or 15 years with asparagus. So what are you doing with your other acres? Uh, we, we produce um, a lot of peppers, bell peppers, and we also grow onions within our operation. Um, so again, we talk about, um, adding value to crops along the way. Um, it's very, very important to us to, to do so. So we started doing, uh, working with a large freezing operation here in Ontario a bunch of years ago. And they came to us and said, Hey, can you, you've got this amazing facility, use it for your asparagus season. It was back in the good old days when the margins were, um, very, very good. Um, and they came to us and said, you know, you're not using it for 10 months of the year, this amazing facility, you've got food safety, you've got cooling, you've got, you know, infrastructure coming into your yin yang. Why don't you, uh, why don't you process some cauliflower for us? So they came to us and we ended up processing five, six, seven million pounds of cauliflower on an annual basis, basically taking a, a product from other growers and turning it into florets and running it off to their freezing plants. Across I want to hear more about all the entrepreneurial ventures, but I, I wasn't done hearing about the rest of the acres because I find this to be fascinating. And I want to uh -huh. talk about, because there's probably people who are listening to this right now that are some of my ag friends in like Texas that say, I thought it snowed all the time up there. I thought like they farm with snowmobiles up there in Canada. So I want you to address all that. But before we do, I want to talk to you about well, we'll talk to you about somebody that I'm kind of excited about. This company called AgVisor Pro. AgVisor Pro, founded by my buddy Rob Syke, a Canadian as well. Rob Syke started AgVisor Pro because he looked around and realized that information is so available, but we're still in agriculture spending too much more time looking and hunting for this information. A stat that they reference is this. Farmers spend 19% of their time seeking information. 19% of your time is spent seeking information if you're a farm operator. 
The knowledge that farmers need to stay ahead of the curve is out there, but that doesn't mean it's easy to find or is it fast to find it. Rob Syke and the people of AgVisor Pro are fixing that. Simply go on your phone. Everybody has one of these smartphones. Pick it up and put in AgVisor Pro. Go to your app store, AgVisor Pro. It's an app. You put it on there. Guess what? You can be an expert. There's probably something you know a lot about. Sure. Enter yourself. Put up a profile and you can be an expert. All of a sudden, it's an experts network that is on your phone. If you have expertise, you can share them. Also, you can get paid for your expertise. More importantly, if you need great information from an expert, you can find it at your fingertips. Instead of jacking around on ag Twitter all day long and hearing from the, the people commenting that you must be dumb for not knowing the answer, just go to AgVisor Pro. It's an app. Put it on your phone and tell them, I told you to do so. All right, I'm talking to my friend Ken Wall, Sandy Shore Farms. Those other acres that are not in asparagus, you don't buy, it's not, we're not talking about corn or soybeans or any of that. You do other produce. You said something about garlic. What's the other, what's the stuff that's out there? And then are you the operator or do you just have other people do that and you concentrate on the other businesses? No, we've actually got a, a, a farm operations team. And so we're growing both peppers and onions on the remaining uh, uh, acres that we do have. And those are rotated typically on four year cycles. Uh, what we started doing a, a number of years ago, I was at a, um, uh, a processing vegetable conference and there was a, a speaker there from the Ministry of Ag Agriculture and Food here in Ontario. And, and she threw in an idea. She says, uh, um, hey, you know, you uh, vegetable producers really need to think about doing something, uh, I don't know, like maybe incorporating some forage crops into your vegetable crop rotation. And it was a throwaway line and I was done. I couldn't believe I hadn't thought of that one before. I came home to the guys and I said, hey, you know what? This is what I just heard. Is there some way of taking advantage of that? How can we benefit ourselves, you know, with uh, nitrogen fixation, with organics, uh, so organic matter enhancements and that sort of thing. So before you know it, they had 150 acres of our uh, uh, land into forage crop. We're now up to about 300, I think, 300 acres of forage crops. And we use that on a three-year rotation. So we get three years of uh, forage, typically legume and a timothy. Put in alfalfa? You put in alfalfa? Yeah. And then uh, then there's, uh, I know that like the London, Ontario area has a great deal of uh, dairy operations. Is there a yeah. dairy operation that will come and buy the chop off of you? We're, what we're doing, we're not actually doing that ourselves. We lease it out to a, a local operator who's got all the capacity and expertise to run the forage and handle the forage. Uh, we just don't have the, the capacity right. to do so. But it ends up and, on a dairy farm? Yeah, ends up typically on a dairy farm. There's some cat, uh, beef cattle operations in the area as well. And so, um, but the nice thing is, um, and we've just started this year. So we had three years of, of alfalfa and then we took it out and we put a, a pepper crop in. Uh, into one particular field. And we've never seen, um, we've had amazing success with it. And we're seeing so organic matter enhancements. Um, I, I think we're, without question, obviously we're getting some nitrogen credits. We're able to reduce some of the nitrogen costing associated with producing peppers. So we've had some really, really good su uh, success with, with that um, modification in our program. So the person that is listening to this from the panhandle of Texas that's never been north of the border is saying, hey, wait a minute. Man, they, like, they, they have sled dogs up there in Canada, I, and they live in igloos. Okay, we all know that that's you know, a joke. I've worked all over Canada and, and spoken to potato people and oats people and dairy people and whatnot. Ontario, where you are, across the Lake Erie from Cleveland, you have a microclimate, I think it's been described to me, right? When you're around the Great Lakes, just like Michigan has wineries and grape vineyards, and you're like, what? I thought that happened in California. So there's grape production, I think, on both sides of the, the lakes up there where you are. There's um, uh, fruit production. So tell us climatologically what happens there um, that makes you uh, unique. Well, a couple of things, uh, Damien. First of all, take a look at the um, uh, look at a map, and um, we're actually somewhat south of Northern California, and so where we farm, um, we're um, we're significantly south of you know large portions of Washington, Oregon, and California. So 
um, we're we're uh, we're really not in northern latitude. Long. Latitudinally, you're not as far north as people would think. That that's uh, correct. The map. So latitudinally, you're not that far north. Go ahead. Yeah. The other thing is uh, being surrounded by the lakes. Um, we get a lot of moderation, and so um, you know we get some relatively uh, an opportunity to get a relatively early start. We were planting crops here uh, on our farms the first part of April, first week of April. Um, and, um, we had a slight frost here today is, what is it? The October, the 5th. Um, and we had a light frost here a couple of days ago, but no damage whatsoever. We're typically, uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, and, and that has changed over the last 30 or 40 years, but we'll be harvesting peppers until the end of October here in this community. So we've got a relatively long growing season and we're extremely fortunate to be able to have access to that. So that moderating influence of the, of the lakes has been a great benefit to us. And uh, the other nice thing is we've had plenty of moisture. You know, we hear about the droughts uh, that have gone on in, uh, you know, various regions throughout North America and Europe. And we've been extremely fortunate. Um, uh, we really haven't experienced that. And we've got access to a large body of water, obviously immediately to the south of us that we can access for water and many growers do. And we also have access to, um, you know, we've got a lot of streams and creeks and ponds and tributaries and whatnot that we can all access. So, uh, and groundwater levels are fairly decent. We're pulling, um, we're irrigating out of groundwater uh, for uh, on a number of our fields. So we just pull, you know, 90, 100 gallons a, a minute coming out of some of these points. Yeah, so you, you know, and I've had this discussion. In fact, I'm looking for a, a water expert to do an episode of this podcast uh, because I believe that we're we're getting real close to the battle over water um, yeah. being a real thing. It's kind of always been a thing for if you're a California producer, but it's, it's th that whole battle is going to become a battleground for all of ag. And I'm in an area that generally has water. You're in an area that generally has water, and it does then give you comfort but also it makes you think these assets meaning the farm ground that you and i both own probably is going to hold up better because it has precipitation and we have groundwater and you've got a lake etc so you got the climate you got the uh the, the stuff the harvest of and by the way is everything irrigated do you irrigate all 1500 of your acres um yeah pretty well there's a couple of blocks that don't have access ready access to water and so we we simply don't we we grow other things there but yeah pretty much the entire uh, operation has got access to we've got underground main lines and we can pump water on almost every acre that we have your farm is called sandy shore farms uh is most of your ground got some sand component to it Oh gosh! Uh, you're you're on the north shore the of a field, you reach down, you wonder whether or not you're on the beach or whether you're farming on the. Because you're on the north shore of a lake, so yeah. you do need the water. Typical irrigation: you use subsurface drip, you do flood, you do pivots. What do you do? Uh, there are a few pivots just popping up in the area. I, I love love the concept. We don't have any of those. We do some travelers. They're a, a traveler system, overhead system. Um, we've gone uh, into some subsurface drip as well. And in fact, all the asparagus that we put in the ground in the last four or five years is all had subsurface drip with questionable results. I'm not a, a fan as of yet. So we're still learning on that. I think there's some different things that we can do along I, those lines. I believe, um, and, and I worked for Extreme Ag, and I told you about that before we started recording. So if you're listening to this, dear uh, listeners, Extreme Ag is a collection of uh forward-thinking large-scale farm operators that I record their podcast, Cutting the Curve. And I also host events for them and I show up at different uh, events for them and I film videos for them. So go to extremeag.farm, extremeag, no E on the front of it, extremeag.farm. But if you go there, you can also look at several episodes we've recorded about subsurface drip irrigation. I am convinced that it is going to be the irrigation of the future because it's more efficient. And if we're fighting over water and you can use 30% less, I believe that subsurface drip is going to be the way to go. It puts the water generally where you need it. Not saying it's a perfect system yet, because we know that in general, irrigation comes from the, the skies. And so it, it, to emulate that. So you put this in, you put the water out there on all this stuff. Um, you can control a lot of things. Your farming happens from April through Halloween. Good for you. What uh, what thing do you battle that we wouldn't think about besides when it finally turns cold and all that? What thing do you battle that the average person in uh, the Plains states wouldn't think about? Well, I think more and more of us are thinking about it because we're hearing about, you know, the great resignation and labor issues. 
Uh, labor has been, has, has been our biggest issue in horticulture production in North America for 20, 30 years. We used to have people lining up. We had lists of literally hundreds of people, local people looking for work in our uh, production season. Um, now it's virtually impossible to get local labor. We do have some. They're amazing. We're very, very, very thankful. But we rely almost exclusively anymore. And most of horticulture here in Ontario relies on a program very, very similar to your H2A. So many of your American listeners will, will recognize that terminology. And we've done an episode before with a California producer who yeah. was essentially an expert on H2A uh, visas to get uh, seasonal workers and, and temp workers here for production ag. Go ahead. It's the only way we survived right now. Uh, we brought in, I think we had 290 uh, seasonal workers, um, either primarily uh, Caribbean and Mexico, um, we hope to, to move a little more into Central America at some point, just to bro broaden the scope a little bit. But we're extremely thankful for these guys. They've been, uh, they do an amazing job for us. They're here to work. They're very keen. They're very gung-ho. It's probably the best third world aid program uh, that the Canadian government has ever come up with. And so I give kudos to the Canadian government for implementing in the 60s in the first place. And secondly, for maintaining the program. Uh, yeah. over the last uh, bunch of years. So we're completely reliant on that program here. In Ontario. Yeah, that's important information because I've talked about that on this podcast and to my audiences, the issue uh, of labor, 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 who's going to do the work. In my book, Food Fear, I talked at great length, who, who's doing the work, who's doing the yeah. farming. Yeah. Uh, stat from 2017 here in the United States of America, um, an ungodly amount, like, you know, 74% of hired labor is from offshore. And half of it is here illegally. And uh, the, the, the system is, it works only because we know we need the food. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not right. And uh, it doesn't, doesn't um, it's not without its flaws. I, I think there's serious issues associated with the whole labor piece in, in both Canada and the U.S. You talked about undocumented. We don't have that issue to the same extent because we don't have a uh, and uh, an open border or a border, which is prone to be. You don't have an open border, Ken. I'm an American <laughs> that tries to come up there and just work. And I'm not, I can barely yeah, get good luck. country. You people are terrible. Oh, you Thank Americans you. are so mean talking about building a wall. Try to get into Canada. I can't even go up there and see you. And I'm like, what? You people are awful about your border. Yeah. Not very welcoming, are we? Haven't been in the last number of years. That's for sure. That's for sure. It, uh, the labor issue is of grave concern to many of us. And, and one of the, the, the biggest pieces that kind of keeps me awake at night is, so there's my own business and all of us in horticulture, and we're all dependent on a labor program that is run by our federal government and is prone to political disruption. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, you know, there's a, 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 an issue that happens somewhere or other, and our government will run to the, uh, you know, immediately to the media and say, we're going to crack down, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And, you know, a lot of us who treat our workers fairly and decently, suddenly we're in the crosshairs. And our food security is also in the crosshairs in, in the same way. You're preaching the choir here, brother, just because I also I think that we need to make sure that a lot of folks don't get this, that they think that it's, you know, akin to slavery. And I've heard this from people who more lean left than uh, you can imagine that uh, food is your your program. Like I think it was something like 16 bucks an hour plus housing and maybe even like a meal allowance or something. They get paid pretty well, the workers that you're bringing in, correct? Uh, they get paid. It's a, a mandated um, amount that's negotiated between the government of Canada and uh, the countries themselves. So both Mexico and the, all the Caribbean countries, they actually negotiate and set a wage, uh, which is at least and sometimes higher than our minimum wage here in Canada. Uh, and they're provided housing at absolutely no cost. Um, there's a, a small deduction for uh, for uh, some of the um, uh, um, utilities that, that are being used, but it's a very good program. Um, the guys are treated well. We have guys that are coming back within this community sometimes for uh, 20 and 30 years. We have multi-generational folk that come back year after year after year. Nobody's requiring them, uh, forcing them to come back. Um, keep in mind that a lot of these guys, I, I say, well, so why did you leave your family for, you know, four or five, six months? Um, 
great program. I'm able to find, uh, feed my family efficiently. I'm able to actually put my kids through school, through university. Yeah. Uh, I'm able to, to, you know, uh, look after some medical issues that, because, uh, you know, it's, it's not a social welfare medicine type of an arrangement in, uh, in some of these countries. So this is an amazing program that allows people yeah. a hand up, not a handout. It's a hand up. And we get people returning on an annual basis coming back. You, here, know, here. you told me you have about 450 employees with your 1500 acres of specialty crops and the processing facility. And then whatever else you do there, does that include the seasonal or is that 450? Then you get an extra. No, no, it's that includes the seasonal. Okay. So all year round, there's an additional 150 to 200 employees there. And then there's a couple, two to 300 come seasonally. Is that what I'm hearing? More or less. Yeah. yeah. What, what about um, another entrepreneurial venture? Well, you looked around and said, we need this equipment to make our business run more smoothly and nobody's making it. So we're going to start making it. Is that how it happened? We started um, uh, looking at the way we're harvesting asparagus and it was being done the same way it was done when my grandfather was growing it. And that was using these three and five and sometimes seven man carts that slowly crawled across the field. In some cases, guys were physically walking across and then bending over. And that still happens uh, through uh, portions of, of North America as well. Cut it. You cut the, you cut the stalk. That's correct. Um, then- in, yeah. In some cases, growers are, are snapping the stalks. Michigan is primarily a snapping uh, community. So uh, one way or the other, you got to bend over. You got to access that. It's a very, very manual intensive pro labor intensive process yeah, and there is grows six and seven inches in a day on a hot day and so you have to go across every single day in some cases we harvested twice a day this year so a lot of labor very very difficult backbreaking, difficult kind of a process uh, we looked at about five six years ago and said gosh sakes there's got to be a better way of doing this and and uh and so we came up with a few ideas. Somebody said, hey, let's move away from a three-man cart where everyone is moving at the same speed or a five-man cart, same sort of thing. Let's move towards a one-man cart. And, and when said, you say cart, you mean like the, 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 the person rides and then yes. instead of having to walk and bend over, they ride right. close down to the ground. That's correct. Are they more reaching over then to the right and left and picking or cutting? Yeah. Yeah, they're cutting or snapping or whatever they're doing. So we took a look. I did a Google search and suddenly realized, oh, my gosh, there's a company in Holland building these things, one man carts. So I bought um, a couple sight unseen. I said, yeah, yeah, just ship me over some. I want to try these things. Uh, They came on over. We played with them. They were electric, battery powered and very uh, electronic. And, um, And they worked amazingly well when they were working. Um, and so I said to the, the company in Holland, I said, my gosh, make it really simple. So, it, it, you know, uh, somebody as simple and ignorant as I am can actually get on this thing and, and operate it very, very quickly. And they said, no, 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 no. we want to add GPS and we want to you can sit in your office and control these things. And I said, no, I want simple, simple, simple. Anyway, um, they wanted to go in a different direction. And so we said, let's build our own. So we did. Um, And we worked with an agriculture and engineering company here in the province, and we came up with an amazingly simple, easy design. Damien, even you and I can get on these things, and in five minutes, you know exactly how they work. They're self-steering, in essence, self-centering. You run down the row. And I run down a row, and then do do I cut on both sides? Do I go right and left? No, you're straddling. You're straddling the row. and and I'm just cutting the one that's in front of me. That's correct. So I just ride along and I just cut right here in front of me and, and then I'm not bent over. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we designed a thing. We called it the Mantis. Uh, probably a, an amazing, uh, it just, we basically doubled our productivity per man hour yeah. and uh, dramatically reduced our labor requirements and uh, reduced our costing. And it's worked out extremely well. We've sold those throughout North America um, and also in uh, shipped a number of seatainers into New Zealand of all places. We're, Got it. I love yeah. it. The entrepreneurial side. I want to finish with asparagus because I don't want to keep our listeners here all night. But um, uh, I told you I got a patch of it. And also it grows up wild in some of the side ditches. Every spring, starting in yeah. late spring, early summer, people that are asparagus hounds kind of then drive along and find asparagus out in, this, in your side ditch. They hop over and they pot, you know, they, they pick it. People get really excited about asparagus. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting vegetable. 
Uh, I don't mind it. I just don't get gaga over it. It's just, it's, it's like green beans or whatever to me, carrots. Um, what is the deal with asparagus? Why do people get so excited about it? Like if you uh, put, if you put cauliflower next to uh, a fancy filet at some event, it's like, well, that doesn't seem right. But by God, if you put asparagus down and ladle some Bernays sauce over it or something, what's, what's the deal? Uh, great question. Um, Here's an interesting one. You think North Americans go gaga over it. Um, in Germany, they have festivals in most of the communities, and it's the, you know, it's the first vegetable this spring. Their per capita consumption in Germany is north of five pounds per capita. And they do the vast majority of that consumption takes place in their local season. Here like in, in North June, America, like in like June, all of a sudden April, April, May, and June. And here <laughs> in North America. Um, per capita consumption is about a third of that, 1.7, maybe one point, trending up to 1.8 pounds per capita. So somehow or other, the Germans have, have done something. It's the first vegetable, fresh vegetable this spring, although our greenhouse friends will take exception to that. Yeah, right. So, you know, everyone gets excited. Ah, the first vegetables, we don't have to eat turnips and uh, rutabagas that we've, us Canadians eat all winter long. Can you yeah. start eating some fresh green asparagus coming up out of the ground? Is asparagus grown? Okay, we, we know it's a European thing. You just talked about Germany a lot, and obviously it's a North American thing. And you said you get imports, and I'm all about, I'd rather the stuff come from the United States or Canada versus you said coming in from Peru? Yeah. Um, both Peru and Mexico are massive exporters of asparagus. There's not a lot of consumption taking place in their own countries. Um, and that uh, labor um, issues have basically forced uh, much of the asparagus grown that used to be grown in North America down into uh, both Peru and Mexico. Um, you know, way. 10 bucks a day um, will do the job for you in Peru and, and Mexico. And so it's very, very difficult for us in North America as to domestic compete. producers to act, be able to compete. Are you more productive per acre? I mean, you said 8,000 pounds. Do they get that in Mexico? Um, in some cases, they'll get ten and twelve thousand pounds because so they have they have as good a yields and they also have cheaper labor. So, how are you still able to compete? Um, a combination of things. Number one, um, their product is being shipped. They can't afford to fly it in anymore. They used to um, out of Peru. Now they're shipping it in by boat. Typically, it's seven days on a boat. Lands in Miami or Tampa, um, and then it's got to go through. Um, uh, some fumigation processes. And so by the time it actually, to make sure that we're not importing some sort of right. bug that's going to kill all of our American agriculture. Yeah. yeah. So the, by the time it hits the grocery store in Philly, um, it's got basically 24 to 36 hours of shelf life and you take it home. And I mean, we've all seen this stuff and it's not pretty and it's not because they're not good producers. It's, it's because, because it the, went through, it went through two weeks of getting the shit yeah. out of it before it ever even got, uh, yeah. to the customer, right? Yeah. So we're, we're selling freshness. We're not selling asparagus as much as we're selling local and freshness into the North American market. Again, I can be in, I can have a team um, in place and have product into, you know, the Southwest um, in two and a half days. Uh, so we're, we're very, very competitive in terms of freshness, local carbon footprint issues without question. Um, so we uh, we market that and, and vlog that component of our industry. And I think we've had good success doing that. Your asparagus producers are, you don't have protections. Like we talk about supply management on milk and poultry and eggs in Canada. No. There's no such thing. So it's an open market on asparagus. 100% open market. So we deal competitively with, um, you know, we're, we're fighting Peruvian and, and Mexican imports uh, throughout our season, in fact, this last year in our local community, the heart of our asparagus growing uh, community, there was a uh, large major retailer uh, featuring Peruvian asparagus on May the 24th when our coolers were full. In fact, we were mowing down some fields because we couldn't find uh, markets for, uh, for some of our product. So we always have to be competitive at a price level. Yeah. Um, and it's frustrating when um, you know everyone wants local the question is, are you prepared to pay for it? Because right, yeah. it's very it's difficult for us to be competitive at a, at a, you know, at a price level. The old thing about what the consumer says and what the consumer does. Yeah, there's a difference. Really, you know, there's you know, a difference. I, I, I'd pay more for that. Well, you didn't. Um, so there is that concern, although many do. Although in inflationary times like this, many don't because they're getting whacked at the grocery store. Uh, to the tune yeah, of and, and you can't blame people for that. 13 
0.4% increase in food at the grocery store year over year in the United States and worsening by the day. Real quickly uh, about consumption. You said they grow up in Peru and Mexico, but don't have hardly any consumption. Is asparagus mostly a Europe, if you're from European descent, you eat asparagus, but if you're from India or Africa or East Asia, China, you, is it is it one of those things? It's a Euro, it's a Euro thing? Well, I think there's some of that, but also keep in mind that the largest producer of asparagus in the globe is China. They produce a lot of asparagus over there and consume a lot of asparagus. So it's not truly just a, you know, people of European descent. Okay. I think what that, what it does suggest though, is that uh, I think there's great marketing opportunities for us growers here in North America to start marketing more towards people of different ethnicity and, and focus on some of those other com uh, communities and say, Hey, Here's a great product, amazingly nutritional. Mm -hmm. um, there are some incredible, in fact, um, I'd love to come back on your show at some point and tell you about some new research that the industry has just um, been, been uh, we haven't funded it, it's just been uh, funded independently, but there's some new research talking about amazing health benefits associated with the consumption of asparagus. So we're really, really excited about, about talking about that. It's prolific, and, you know, 8,000 pounds to the acre, I mean, the potato people get like 30,000 pounds or some oh, 50 crazy, or 60, 50 or 60 thousand pounds. So, I mean, potatoes are the way to go if you just need calories, but 8,000 pounds per acre. I mean, I think I'm thinking you're beating green beans and carrots probably. Are you not? Um, certainly not carrots. Um, carrots do more than that. Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, uh, Carrots, onions, and and potatoes, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 pounds is not unheard of. Okay, I stand, I stand corrected. See, next, if you're listening to this, I need to bring on a new potatoes because I've worked for those people. If you're an onion or a carrot producer, uh, give me a jingle and I'll bring you on. I will hear about that. His name is Ken Wall, Sandy Shore Farms. Last thought on the way out the door here. Um, I, I think... I think North American agriculture and especially horticultural production uh, is in for some significant and radical changes over the next number of years. We've been facing- How many years? How many years? Um, I'm going to say five years. And it's going to be confronted the labor issue. I think the labor issue, I think input costing is very, very significant. And I also believe, uh, and this is gravely concerning for me because we're getting uh, some- uh, um, uh, pushback from the federal government in terms of um, uh, some of the um, uh, impact uh, on our, you know, the environment and, and talking about reducing fertilizer emissions by 30%. Yeah, so I was going to say, That's we know the grave way. concern to us. I, I'd say the environmental thing is not just a horticulture and specialty crop. It's going to no. be all of us. And no, absolutely. I, I mean, we're all a little, I, I believe that there's too much ideology masking itself as science and when you look at the netherlands as an example we're talking yeah, about we're talking, we're talking about jeopard jeopardization of food security over yeah. the idea of being green and it's really uh, tragically frightening i think because the average consumer doesn't doesn't see what's happening and you and i do all right Big changes coming to produce. And you just said environmental, which we're both scared about. Uh, labor, of course, is already happening and been happening. And then there's the other issue of costs, et cetera. Yes. Um, if you want to learn more about asparagus and what happens, what's your website, Ken? It's sandyshowfarms.ca. You can also get a clue into our um, um, the asparagus farmers of Ontario.ca, AFO.ca. So there's some inf interesting information that uh, Brandon, who looks after that, and the uh, Growers Association who maintains that. There's some really good information there as well. You've given us lots and lots of really good information. I like it. The first asparagus guy I've talked to, he's an asparagus entrepreneur. This has been a conversation with an asparagus entrepreneur. His name's Ken Wall. He's my new buddy from the from the North Shore of Lake Erie on the Canadian side. And until next time, thanks for being here, by the way. My pleasure. Till next time, it's the business of agriculture. Hey, thanks for being here. This episode of the Business of Agriculture was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You've heard me talk about Pattern Ag because I think it's a pretty cool concept. New technology that allows you to predict the problems you're going to have and therefore treat them before those problems cost you money. What kind of problems am I talking about? Pests, 
and disease. Things like cordon rootworm, uh, sudden death syndrome, cyst nematode, and a whole bunch of other bad things that happen out there in the field that can cost you money. Guess what? Pattern Ag will let you find out ahead of time if the disease or the pest pressure is there and therefore you're treating it before it costs you any money. What a great concept. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to learn more about their product, their technology, how it can make you money, save you yield, and all also, where you can find a rep that can come out there and do the work for you. Pattern.ag. 